Okay, Jim, I thought we'd just start out with, um, uh, because this this whole segment is really about how COVID has affected cli- either climate change or the research into climate change. And I thought yours was a great example. But I think first, um, I don't know whether I would describe it, but I'd rather have maybe you describe it, just sort of briefly the, the purpose of your research, why you're up in the Arctic and what that means uh, to, okay. to climate change research. Sure. Uh, So I'm an oceanographer, and uh, a lot of my work centers in the polar regions. In in the Arctic, uh, much of my work has been focused on the retreat of the seasonal sea ice and what that means for the overall system. Uh, One of my specialties is ocean surface waves, and those waves are really increasing as as the Arctic melts and as the sea ice retreats, leaving open water behind, uh, that open water is real estate for waves to form and the waves are getting quite a bit bigger in in recent years. So I spend uh, a fair amount of time, maybe on average one or even two months a year in the Arctic, um, conducting some of this research and making measurements and uh, putting instruments in place and whatnot. Um, and then, you know, the rest of the time uh, I teach at the university and and work on data analysis and uh, trying to understand what all this, all the data means. And what's the practical effect of this retreat of ocean sea ice? Uh, the the retreat of sea ice, which is happening uh, every, has been happening every summer for a long time, and it and it is uh, increasing in its extent. So the the sea ice is going further and further back to the north every summer, and also is happening earlier in the season and persisting later in the season. Uh, that that signal opens up the ocean to to receive the sun's rays directly. So there's a lot of heating that's happening in the ocean because the ice isn't there to reflect the, the sun's rays anymore. Uh, and that, of course, has these feedback mechanisms because then the ocean gets warm. And then once the ocean's warm, it, it can melt more ice or, or it makes it harder for the ice to refreeze when the winter comes. Uh, and then the open ocean also, uh, it means that waves can form uh, whenever there's a storm and, and wind is blowing across the water. Now the, the water can form waves, whereas if the ice was there, the wind would move the ice around. It would, it would cause the ice to drift and move around. And once those waves form, they can, they can do a few different things. They can propagate and end up at the edge of the ice, and then they can go into the ice and penetrate into the ice, mm-hmm. and they can cause the ice to break up. Uh, and that can have feedbacks because once the ice breaks up a little bit, it's more prone to melt, and so then more ice can retreat, and then more waves can form. There's mm-hmm. one feedback mechanism. Uh, the other thing the waves can do is they can they can go to the coast, and when they get to the coast, they can cause erosion, just like they do any other coastline around the world. Um, but it's particularly strong in the Arctic because the Arctic coasts uh, generally have been in a very low wave environment. There have not been big waves, you know, historically, and and now that the ice is retreating so fast, uh, now there are these big waves, and that when they make it to the coast, they're much bigger, and the and the coastlines are being pretty dramatically affected. Uh, the coastlines in the Arctic are also unique in that they're mostly made of permafrost. And so as much as they can be eroded, they can also just be melted. And the, and the coast will just sort of fall apart if there's any warm water that inundates the, the coastal region. Then the, the land basically just melts because it was only held together by, by being frozen. And does this affect, uh, not to get us, steer us off course too much, but... Um... Presumably, this uh, affects indigenous communities who live along the coast. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that that's one of the the most immediate impacts is uh, those communities are already having to pick up and retreat and move their communities or move portions of their infrastructure. You know, uh, roads being washed out and and things like that, and their their access to the ocean, boat ramps, and things like that, um, which are really important for their their subsistence harvesting. Uh, you know, those kinds of coastal infrastructure are, are very vulnerable and there's a lot of change happening rapidly. I, the, the average rate of retreat of the Arctic shorelines is about two meters per year. And in some places, it's 10 meters in a single year that the shoreline is just marching backwards towards the land. It's really remarkable. So, so how'd you get the news? That, well, talk about how COVID-19 affected your latest trip. So, in the fall of 2019, we did an expedition along the Arctic coast and put out a total of 12 moorings to measure the water temperatures and to measure the wave heights throughout an entire annual cycle, a seasonal cycle from 
summer when there's open water and there's retreating sea ice to winter when the ice comes back. And then again, to the next summer, we wanted to understand that seasonal cycle and how these warmer water and increased open water and less sea ice, how, how that's all working together. And so before the pandemic, we put all these moorings out and then the pandemic hit and we had plans uh, for the fall, for fall of 2020 to go and pick up all 12 of those moorings. And this is a case where if you don't recover the moorings, you don't get the data. You don't, you know, it's a, it's a total loss if you don't get them back. These are below the surface so that they can uh, safely withstand the winter ice. And so mm -hmm. we have no connection. We have no remote connection to them. There is no telemetry. There's no way to get this data back. So it isn't, there's, no, there's no satellite feed that goes up there. Exactly. So without recovering them, all that data would be lost. And, uh, you know, it's a very unique data set. Um, you know, very climate relevant data set. And if we weren't able to go uh, to pick up these moorings, we wouldn't be able to, to get the data back. And in fact, we would never be able to get it back because th these moorings each had a set of batteries that were um, mm -hmm. separate from the instruments recording the data, another set of batteries uh, there for recovery. And uh, the way it works is when we get close to the mooring, we can send it uh, a, a sonar signal and tell it to come to the surface. So it actually releases a messenger line to the surface. And if that battery fails, then we're never you able to, to trigger that recovery sequence or to find it again. So uh, we had this critical need to get these moorings back this year. And uh, after the pandemic had started and, and a, a few months into uh, the overall response to the COVID-19 crisis, the National Science Foundation came up with a, um, a series of protocols for what research could still be done during the pandemic and what would need to be postponed. And they had a ranking system for what is the highest priority. And we were designated at the uh, priority one because this data would otherwise we'd be lost. And it's long-term data, right? It's a whole annual cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that allowed us to, to begin the process of trying to plan how we would do this research during COVID. It didn't mean it would just an automatically, you know, we'd get to be able to, to, to do it, to go get the mooring. Um, but it at least put us in a position to start the planning. And then we spent the next several months working with um, the research vessel and the captain and crew of the research vessel that we had planned to use to establish a set of protocols for how we would do this. So in the end, what we did is we did successfully go get these moorings and get the data back. We flew to Alaska, and when we arrived in Alaska, we tested before we went. We arrived in Alaska with our negative tests, and that allowed us to enter the state. And then we went to the port where the ship um, comes in and out and, uh, and where they get their supplies and fuel and everything. And we quarantined there uh, for two weeks. Uh, in quarantine, all the members of the, the science team were quarantined separately so that if any one person had a positive test, then it wouldn't take the whole mission down, right? That person would just go home or, well, they'd quarantine until they was, could safely go home. Uh, so that was a lot of time just sitting in a, we rented these apartments and we just sat there for two weeks. And uh, for the most part, we were able to continue some of our regular, uh, regular jobs and, you know, do things by Zoom. And I spent a lot of time looking at data from our previous project. We got three series of tests during the quarantine to make sure that we weren't developing something. And then we were able to board the ship and everyone else who was going to board the ship, who were the ship's crew, the professional mariners who run the ship, all the way down to the cook and the dishwasher, um, they had all been doing the same thing separately from us, everyone separate from each other. So we finally can board the ship. And that was in the middle of September, about the time we can do that. And then we actually start uh, the trip. The trip was much, much longer than it would have been. Normally, we would use the port of Nome, Alaska, and that's in the Bering Strait, and it's the furthest north that a large ship can, can come into port. It's the furthest north deep water port in the state of Alaska, where you can get fuel and food and provisions. And, everything. Mm -hmm. and Nome had closed this year during the, the pandemic because they didn't want to introduce COVID-19 to that community. Um, in the end, they did have a few cases. There is air travel to Nome, and they were being very careful, but they still had a few cases. But they they asked us specifically, you know, not to use the port, not to come. So we had to honor that. So we had to drive all the way around, and we started in the port of Seward, Alaska, instead. Um, this added ten days onto the front of the trip, going around, and added another ten days onto the back end of the trip. So in the end, um, the 
the, the way to just encapsulate it is in the number of days. This was originally planned before the pandemic to be an 18-day trip. In the end, it was a 50-day trip with all the quarantine and the extra transit and all this extra time. So it really turned into a much, much longer expedition. Are there any other ways in which COVID is affecting other research you plan to do? I think you mentioned something about studying hurricanes on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, I've had several projects postponed. And in the end, the decision to postpone was largely made as to whether there was already equipment that was deployed and collecting data that would be, you know, critical data that would be lost if we weren't able to go out. And if that wasn't the case, if anything could be postponed, then the guidance was to postpone it. So uh, we have a project that was supposed to be this year that was studying the hurricanes arriving on the East Coast. And of course, it was a really dramatic hurricane season, right? We made it all the way through the alphabet very quickly. Um, a lot of activity at times, there were three or even four systems, uh, three or four storms moving and, and swirling around out there. And it was a very active season. And so it would have been a great one to study. And, and you know, there's a clear need to understand how the warming climate is, is really uh, driving these really active hurricane seasons and, and, you know, where and how they make landfall and to understand all of that. Uh, but we had to postpone that entire project uh, because it, it was a new start. So it wasn't something that, you know, we had already put out equipment, already had a data record started. And so we just moved the whole thing to the right a year. We'll get started next year. Uh, and, you know, next year might not be, uh, every hurricane season is different. Um, I think the overall trend is that it'll be a very active hurricane season again next year, but it, uh, it could be quite different. Um, anyway, so uh, on the one hand, I was disappointed to have that, uh, to have lost that opportunity. On the other hand, I, you know, I don't think the hurricanes, they're not going to shut off anytime soon. So we, we will get a chance to, you know, do that project. I think in the end, that project will be successful. Um, but we, we had to postpone that. You know, I wanted to turn a little bit to uh, um, sort of this, this idea of uh, the political controversies over COVID-19. I'm just wondering whether um, whether you've seen an increase in what we might call the politicization of science um, that, that, um, that has come about either because of COVID-19 or climate change. Do you see any impact there? I think there's a lot. I know a lot of people have been talking about it and there's a lot that's been written about it. I certainly feel it in my specific area of work. You know, I've, um, I've long felt that um, if people were able to go to the Arctic and experience it in person the way I've been, they, that it would really change the minds. It's remarkable. You know, I've only been working up there about 10 years. And in those 10 years, I've seen really dramatic changes. And, and to go to those communities and the, um, and the villages along the northern coast of uh, Alaska and talk to people and talk to them and, and hear what they've uh, seen in, in just a generation, you know, what their grandparents and what their parents grew up with and what they see now for sea ice. The change is so rapid and so dramatic. And it, it's just not something you can deny, right? It just, mm -hmm. you, um, and, and so to see all of that and, and yet know there are people out there who still um, refute and deny climate change is, is, is really frustrating to spend uh, so much time working up there to be away from my family, to be, um, be, I don't know, just putting all this effort in and know that, uh, for some people it's, uh, it, it's just not, um, not registering for them, you know, the urgency of, of the situation. Uh, so that, that is frustrating. And I, I do think that I imagine some healthcare workers have felt the same thing, you know, during, during COVID-19, they felt like they are working themselves uh, to the bone as hard as they can. And yet there are others who are not not taking it seriously, not taking precautions. Um, and the other analogy that's been made that I think really resonates for me is, is how, you know, a small amount of uh, individual inconvenience can have this cumulative effect, right? So, I mean, what we're being asked in COVID, if we're, you know, if we're not first line responders and we're not, um, it, we're being asked to wear a mask. Not very hard, right? Um, you know, uh, there are lots of jobs you do where you might have to wear protective equipment anyway, right? If you work in a shop, you have to wear eyeglasses and you have to wear gloves and you have to wear ear protection. I mean, you know, so we're being asked to do something simple like that. And I think, um, you know, with climate change, some of the solutions are just to, to drive less and to be more thoughtful and efficient about, you know, how we use energy and, and what we do. And, you know, those small things, not a lot to ask for an individual person and what an individual person does doesn't always have a huge effect, but altogether, the cumulative effect can be enormous, can be really meaningful. Uh, so 
it's been frustrating to see uh, another arena. Uh, you know, I, I've seen the climate change a, arena where we haven't been able to get there. We haven't been able to ha have collective action that that gets us where we need to be. To see that play out again in another arena like COVID nineteen has has just been really frustrating and uh, downright depressing. Honestly, I'm wondering whether there's a, even a compounding effect of one upon the other that the same people who you know were downplaying climate change are also downplaying COVID and and what effect this has on you know on science on our on our you know on the community's desire to pursue scientific research. Uh, I think there's still a. A strong desire from someone like myself, who's already dedicated, you know, a career to this, that that um, to keep going. And I certainly, you know, I see a lot of bright spots in the students that I get to work with, who are really motivated and really engaged to to do science, um, to do it, you know, for the greater good. Um, you know, there, there's a real, um, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of energy in some of the young people I'm working with, and and that's wonderful to see. And a lot of people who see you know, climate science and climate justice as being very in, intertwined and, and talk a lot about scholar activism. And so I think there are some bright spots there. I'm, I guess I'm not worried that we're going to lose the pipeline of new scientists because of this, but I am worried that we're, there's a whole, maybe even half of the public in the U.S. that are not coming along with us as we, you know, we learn and, and try to figure out how to come up with solutions. Um, and, you know, if you can't acknowledge a problem, it's really hard to come up with a solution. That's sort of the first part, right? It's just to say we have a problem here, and then and then you start trying to figure out how to solve it. So, um, that I I agree. It just um, it uh, it gives one sort of a, a lot of concern for, uh, for the future for you know, where we go from here. Are there any? Is there any? I hate to even bring this up, but are there any bright spots here? I was talking to a scientist, an oceanographer in Hawaii. Um, and what they were saying was they've noticed that some of the tourist spots where people used to go snorkeling a lot, all of a sudden have really come back. There's fish in the sea and the reefs. Is, are there any, and you know, and other people say, well, we haven't been driving as much, so there's less, you know, pollution. Um, is that a fantasy or are those real? Uh, no, those those things are real. And I think they, uh, uh, they are playing out at the local level very dramatically in, in some cases, you know, less noise pollution, less air pollution, less... Uh, you know, less activity and, and displacing wildlife and those things. Um, and it's great. I think, you know, it's going to take a little while before we know just how long the effect stays after, you know, if we go back to business as usual, once the vaccines are all rolled out, let's say, I hesitate to even guess, but um, let's say mid 2021, you know, much of the U.S. population is vaccinated and business as usual uh, is, is back up and running. Um, I don't know if we'll see long-term benefits from in in sort of the overall environmental space and and uh, the climate system from having this brief pause in human activity or this brief slowdown in human activity. It, it it's unlikely. I mean that you know the the problem that we've created the um, the greenhouse gases the you know carbon that's in the atmosphere. I mean it's taken us so long to do that. It's been such you know. Uh, well over 100 years of that accumulating that you know one year of slowing down a little bit is is unfortunately not appreciable in, in that i know people are studying this and it is it is nice to see some little rebounds here and there but um i don't think that in and of itself is going to be uh, appreciable i do think there are some other bright spots just in terms of this has caused a, a lot of us to slow down a little bit and um and to spend time closer to home to spend more time with our families to reconsider when and why we travel and how much we travel, um, you know, uh, air travel definitely is a big contributor. Um, you, you know, you put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere that way. I still travel by air a lot. I am uh, definitely guilty, as guilty as many others are in terms of my air travel. But um, to realize that you can do an interview like this and you can go to other meetings, um, you, you know, remotely, I think that, I, and I hope that that will persist. That we will do a bit more of that, um, and we'll just be make some sort of wiser choices or prioritize when we when we actually travel and, and and when we do not and we're just more efficient with uh how we do things um and some of the the actual field work that we just did and had this really long trip you know uh i think it's forced us to think a little bit more about how can we most efficiently do that um the climate data that has been able to can keep going during the pandemic the data these you know there's so many data records out there that uh, are really um, 
precious in terms of understanding the climate system because they're long-term records that keep going. And the ones that have been the easiest to maintain and keep going are, uh, are the ones that are most automated during, during this time of the pandemic where it's hard to send people to sea to replace a mooring and it's hard to send people to, the, um, to these remote regions to make measurements. The ones where automated systems are in place that are basically robots. And in, and in my arena, we work with ocean robots a, a lot, and we've been working on developing them and improving them for many years now. And there have been a, there's been a lot of progress. And I, I do see you know, a real role for uh, autonomy and autonomous platforms and, and robotics to, to make a, a, it has made a big difference this year and make a big difference going forward in how we sample the, the earth system and sample the climate. And so uh, this moment where we're really restricted has, has been a moment for those systems to shine. And there's a lot of data that we've still been able to collect because of these autonomous systems. And um, I guess that's been a bright point. So in a way, it sounds like because of, I don't want to overstate what you're saying, but almost because of the limitations that COVID has imposed on us, we see perhaps ways to do research that actually will lower our impact on climate change, on pollution. So um, now, interesting. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, it, it is one of the ironies is not lost on me that, you know, in order to do some of this climate research, we we have to burn fossil fuel and we have to um, that that is how we get to some of these remote locations. Um, you know, I, and in some cases it just has to be done. And, you know, I, I think of um, the analogy in the medical profession where, you know, sometimes you need to um, to take a pinprick to get some blood to get the information you need to know what's happening with the patient and so you have done a very small and temporary amount of harm in order to do uh to do good to have you know to have the information you need and so uh i i hope that the research is uh, the way we do the field work is is in that category but it is a concern and we do look for ways to make our our field work as low impact as possible and i i i, I agree this moment is um encouraging us to think even harder about how to do that and, uh, and it's you know forcing us to do it right. The necessity being the mother of invention, you know, we are inventing some uh, some novel ways to get this data this year when we you know, otherwise otherwise the option would have been to not get the data at all. Yeah, yeah. You talked about and, and you touched on a little earlier about the sort of the push and pull between individual and communal risk and responsibility. Um, have you thought any more about that? Certainly thought a lot about uh, you know how how people make those decisions. Um, you know, for for this trip we went on, uh, I was the chief scientist, and so I'm in the leadership role, um, helping you know uh, put together a protocol for here's how we're going to do things, and then um, explaining to people, you know, here here is here's the program, um, and explaining in a way that you know made it clear that this is these were requirements, but also this is the reason that we're doing it, and that's pretty easy to do on a smaller scale where, you know, there were a total of, of 30 people on board that ship um, and, and you know, uh, explaining to them that these are the requirements, this is how we're going to do it. Um, it's their job. And and so that was relatively easy to do, but it still was a responsibility to, to, to uh, figure out what the protocols are. And I think about how do you get a larger population? How do you get the entire United States of America to, to, um, to get on board with a set of protocols and programs? And I think that you know, that's the role of government. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a very different thing than, you know, a leader of a small group of people saying, here, we're doing this. You know, government is this vast thing, especially the U.S., but it, it does really need that kind of um, uh, just simple communication and decision making and leadership. And I think uh, it's been uh, been really noticeable that we haven't had the leadership to to explain to the general public, like, this is, you know, what needs to do, and we're all doing it, and let's get on board, and let's, let's get this done. And I, because I think these things where you have, you know, relatively low individual risk, but large collective risk, and uh, a relatively modest set of things that can be done by individuals that would make a big in difference to the whole community, um, those are the things where you, you do need these, you know, societal, cultural, pressures and, and leadership, and you need, you need government to step in. And I think that's exactly what we need to respond to the climate crisis. And uh, we clearly haven't had enough of it, right? There's so much more to be done. Um, and so I am not a policy person. You know, I am a, I am a, a scientist. I do the calculations and the measurements and the numbers, but I, I, I do see this huge role for policy and leadership that, um, that has been lacking. In, in, any other issues you'd like to raise about climate change uh, or, or the coronavirus and how that's affected 
affected you and what you want to do? I would just say that it, it has certainly taken a, a lot of the things that we were planning to do this year and um, and forced them to be postponed or paused. Um, it has given me um, a, a lot of frustration and, and uh, a lot of head scratching to try to figure out how to get the most critical things done, you know, data that would otherwise be lost or measurements that we've been making for decades that need to keep going that we, we wouldn't be able to make. Um, it has been uh, uplifting to see the, the community of scientists, my colleagues, um, come together and try to find solutions and, and figure this out. Um, there is a, a separate from the Arctic work we've been discussing, there's a research station that's in the middle of the North Pacific that has been there since World War II. It was originally a weather station, a weather ship to help with the um, all of the aviation that was happening in World War II. And uh, it's one of the longer records we have in the ocean. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it goes back, you know, to the 40s, right? So the uh, we were going to lose uh, some data from that system and uh I, there was another group that was able to get out there that really unrelated to our group entirely and um completely on a volunteer basis without any money changing hands they they installed a whole new system for us and they were able to do you know they really helped us out and they did it just because it was the right thing to do um and uh, you know it, it just uh it felt like okay you know we can we can rally around the important things and uh and, and get things done together. So, um, you know, there is still, there's definitely plenty of hope. And uh, I've, I've had uh, new uh, students to work with this year, some new graduate students starts at, to start and um, seeing, seeing the students uh, really have all this enthusiasm to, to get started on new projects and to work on these issues and, and to start to really build in um, ideas about climate justice and social justice into their science. Um, that that does give me a, a, a bunch of hope, and I think um, the crisis that we're in this moment um, wouldn't have brought that out of uh, of some of these people, certainly even myself, uh, as much without you know without having it without having the crisis bring everything to a focal point. So I think there has been some there's some silver linings there. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jim, I, I want to thank you for for. Dr. Thompson, I want to thank you for the time that you've given us here today. Really appreciate your thoughts.